This story is called Gosel's Free Adventures, and it's the first book in the Gosel series. Chapter 1. Gosel's Toy Certainly, Gosel didn't pay any attention to Ismaliki, or at least, at first, that was how it went. For one, Isa adored math. Liking it was okay, but she was practically obsessed with math. Isa was the nickname Gosel called Ismaliki, her friend, and the most popular girl in her class. She still remembered when Isa had moved in. As a young first grader, she just skipped up to Isa's front step, two houses away from her own, carefree as a blue lark in summer. She remembered when Isa had opened it and said, What is eight times 1002.3? Just like that, casual as ever. Gosel was quite surprised by this and asked, um, 100? For, to her, it seemed an impossible problem. Nope, Isa had laughed loudly. Do better math. But now, Gosel knew Isa lots better. And she knew herself better, too. Gosel was interested in animals. She liked helping them, like when she'd found a squirrel, sick and hardly able to move. She'd given it nuts and water until it was once again well. Yet, here came Ismaliki, up the bike path, toward her. She stood outside by her front step of her house. She stared at Isa's new bike, a shiny Christmas red, and watched her long black hair blow back by the wind. Gazel was filled with jealousy for this girl, three years elder than her. Isa had a perfect manicure, a pet bunny, and a pet turtle. She'd painted the turtle's shell all gold and silver, and Gosel had almost laughed out loud when she'd first seen it. Gosel boldly waved, walked up, and said, Hi, Isa! The girl stopped her perfect bike and smiled. However, her smile wasn't true. It was fake, like the smiles you would give to, well, someone you didn't feel for a lot. Isa had no empathy for Gosel. And Gosel shuddered. Isa dismounted the bike and said, Gosel, I got something for you. She pulled out a pure gold bottle, casually, from her bike basket. If you wonder where she got it, Isa, you must know, is mysteriously rich. She's been so since she had moved in, and Gosel really did not know why. Gosel took the bottle, looked inside, and saw a curled up squirrel, now hers. It was soft and furry and honey brown. Oh, thank you, Isa, cried Gosel. Keep the bottle, too, said Isa. Keep a gold bottle? A pure gold bottle? Uh, thanks so much, Isa, cried Gosel. She thought Isa would demand the bottle back, leaving Gosel only the squirrel. There was definitely something strange and new and unusual in Isa. Gosel knew. Gosel suddenly looked down and spotted a big ball down in the green, fresh grass. It had a rubber band attached to it with a handle attached to that. A face was drawn on it, with a mouth that opened. Being a young child, she was delighted and bent down, picking it up with a small, delicate hand. This was an exciting moment. Her hands tingled as she took a sharpie and wrote on it, Gosel, with no second thought. It was hers. She would keep it forever. What is it? asked jealous Isa. Gosel quickly thought, of a very strange name, because she'd said whatever came into her mind. It's a pole bit, me, she said. Oh, said Isa, that's, uh, cool. Then she flicked her hair and pedaled away. In the back of the bike, Gosel just then noticed a metal black pot that seemed to be, well, for cooking. Not for normal cooking, not for everyday cooking. It looked like the kind of pot that a witch would use. Why was that on her bike? Gosel shrugged it off and headed toward her house. Chapter 2. Writing to Fairies Gosel wrote with her pink marker, and the marks she made on her paper were all smooth and perfect. Light shone across her face. The pulpit mint lay on the hearth. Ashes and lentils scattered the fireplace. It was late evening, and no noise disturbed Gosel. Gosel stepped back when she'd finished. The letter said, Dear, Dear Misty, Misty the Mystery Mr. Fairy, stop, stop causing, causing trouble. trouble. I, I want, want you to, to answer, answer this time, please. 
Will I ever be able to see you? Sincerely, Gazel. Gazel put the letter on the table, then climbed into bed and fell asleep. When she got to the living room the next morning, she found that the fairy had answered. However, it was awful. It said, Dear, Dear Gothel, I, I don't think you'll ever, ever be able to see me, and I love disguising and mysteries. Mystery, mystery fairy. Gaza was furious. She'd always wanted to see a fairy. She wouldn't take that, never. She wrote back. So the next night, she wrote, Mystery, mystery fairy. For your information, I don't like mysteries at all. Please reply. From God. P.S. Don't you dare spell my name wrong. It always bothered Gazel when people did that. Misty hadn't yet. The mystery fairy. But so many people did, after spelling it right. Next, Misty wrote, Gazel, I'm sorry, but I better contain mysteries. You spelled mystery wrong, too. And never mind. From Misty, Gazel thought that was strange. She hadn't spelled her name wrong, but how had Gazel spelled mysteries? M-I-S-T-E-R-I-E-S. Gazel was furious. The next night, she lay in her bed, wide awake. Someone, a girl, with wings and dressed in a flowing white gown, was in the room, too. It was Misty, the mystery fairy. I see you cried Gazel, and she leapt out of bed. Look in the living room, cried Misty. Gazel looked, and nothing was written on the paper. Gazel expected an answer, and she was even more furious. I am disguised, teased the fairy. Gazel snatched Misty's invisible powder from her, and she shrieked, give that back, and then disappeared. She had to hide the powder, but where and how? Misty, far off as she was, wanted to get closer so she could get the powder. Poor Gozzle clutched the powder. The only way to get the powder out of the way, Gozzle decided, was to sell it. Gozzle got out a table and put a white cloth on it. She brought it outside, set it up, and put the powder on it. Unfortunately, Misty still had her disguising powder, and she fixed herself up. Gozzle waited over an hour. Just when she was about to give up, a woman came to buy the powder. She smiled and gave Gozzle the money for it. No, you can have it for free, said Gozzle. Oh, really? she asked. Thank you. As soon as she grabbed the powder, she changed. It was Misty. Misty grinned and sprayed a bubble of foam with the powder around Gozzle. Gozzle helplessly floated away until she looked down and saw a land of wonder. She looked around. It was all grassy and beautiful. She hovered over it for a minute, and there, Gozzle's bubble popped. She felt a fairy who said, Oh my, a human in mystery land. Who are you? asked Gozzle. Torsel, she replied. Crystal, could you take her to her world? Sure, said Crystal. Crystal led her to a castle. Gosel was just confused until she realized it was Crystal's house, and she would stay there for the night. Chapter 3. A Ride Gosel lay awake in her castle room. It was very late, and as she gazed out of her window, she saw the sweet fairy sleigh up in the sky. The sweet fairy was a good fairy who had a sparkly white and silver sleigh. The sleigh was motorized, and it could fly. She also gave out sweets. Gosel opened the door and ran outside into the starry night. Chills on her skin made her shiver. Sweet fairy, sweet fairy, come, cried Gosel. The sweet fairy landed, and Gosel climbed in. Could you take me back to my house? asked Gosel, now in second grade. Yes, yes. cried the fairy, and they drove off. Thank you, said Gosel gratefully. Now, the sweet fairy didn't feel right driving only one child on the sleigh, for there were two seats, and Gozzle only sat in one. Misty, Misty, she called. Come. The mystery fairy heard her and appeared next to Gozzle. 
She chattered non-stop to her on the way and said things that Gosel couldn't understand. One day, she said, an apple and a horse went to a party. The apple couldn't walk, so how did it get there? It's a mystery. The monkey rode on the horse, and there was really no apple in the story. Gosel, whispered the sweet fairy, you, you need, need to, to pretend, pretend that, that you really you know, know Misty, but, but that, that you know her the opposite of what she really is. is. You don't like mysteries, Misty, said Gosel. You like writing back to... But Misty was shaking, and her face was white. <laughs> thundered the sweet fairy. Misty jumped off the sleigh and beat her wings before even touching the ground. Chapter 4 The Rest of the Adventure Misty! cried Gosel. Come here! Misty hesitated, then turned back and sat in the sleigh. You love messes, said Gosel. Stop, she cried. I love clean. The sweet fairy, eager to change the subject, for she had had enough, said, Want, Want some music? music? Gosel nodded. She pushed a few buttons, and lovely music began All to play. Healthy, it was called All is Healthy. And Sleigh of Healthy. Hey, young Misty, why don't you answer my letters? asked Gosel. Misty only smiled strangely. Before Gosel could protest, the sweet fairy landed in Gosel's driveway, and Gosel walked in. Chapter 5 Sugar Mac Gosel stood by her school bus. Someone with bright red hair about her age, a girl, climbed out before Gosel climbed in. Her hair was very wavy, too, and she had striped tights and a white short dress. Hello, she said. Hi, I'm Gosel, said Gosel. Hi, I'm Sugar Mess, said the girl. Do you want me to teach you how to fly? Sure, cried Gosel. But just then, someone landed in front of Gosel. Misty. Oh, no. Chapter 6 An Answer Gosel must not fly, she said sharply to Sugarmass, advancing closer. She has no right to fly. Who are you? asked Sugarmass. An enchantress, Misty, said Misty. Now, go to Gosel's house with her. See something new. Go, Gosel and Sugarmass went into Gosel's house and saw that Misty had answered her letter. Dear Gosel, I, I answered. answered. There, there, I chose, I chose another, another hideout. hideout. You'll, You'll never, never find, find it. it. Ha! I'm a mystery. mystery. Your two-year-old two sister, sister Grease, has the gross ages. ages. That I means she's, she's really gross. gross. For example, she left string cheese that she bit into on the floor. She also has the here you go no from Misty. The here you go no? questioned Gosel. Well, Sugar Mess, you want to sleep over? I set up a trap for Misty. Sugar Mess agreed. And the next morning, Gosel ran out into the living room to see if her trap had worked. She was so excited to see if she'd caught Misty undisguised. What Gosel saw made her stop short. Sugar Mess was caught in the trap the ropes binding her so that she could barely move. I'm sorry, Sugar Mess, cried Gosel, as she loosened the string that Sugar Mess was tangled in. I meant that for Misty. That's fine, Gosel, said Sugar Mess. I'm okay. Oh, really? asked Gosel empathetically, looking at the red imprints all around her delicate legs. I'm really sorry. No, it's fine, said Sugar Mess. Thanks for understanding. You're welcome, said Gosel, then helped clean up the trap and brought Sugar Mess to her own house. By then, they were such good friends. They had known each other for a few months, quite a while now. Chapter 7 The Here You Go No. Grease sat by Gosel in leather chairs at a movie theater. The huge projector screen was showing a horse. Grease snatched up her pacifier, which she still sucked on even though she was about two. She handed it to Gosel and whispered, Here you go. Gosel reached for it, and then Grease pulled her hand back and screamed really loud, No! 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 Grease, whispered Gosel, as half the theater turned around to stare at them. Shh! Grease grinned, and then shoved her pacifier mouthpiece into Gosel's mouth. Ew! cried Gosel a little too loudly. Keep it in! screamed Grease. No! shouted Gosel. By then, the entire theater 
was focused on the two of them. Gozel, embarrassed, spit out the pacifier. And when the movie was over, Gozel stayed a safe distance from Greece for weeks. She went right to Sugarmuss's house. Sugarmuss and Gozel talked about the here you go now. They both agreed that it was really creepy. After that, the two girls walked to Gozel's house and talked a little more. Just then, the doorbell rang. It was Greece. She stepped in, smiling. Who's that? asked Sugarmuss. My sister, replied Gozel, the one we were just talking about. Greece, gasped Sugarmuss after a while. Look, Gozel. Gozel looked, and to her terror, Greece was unweaving Sugarmuss's dress. It was white, shining silk, and looked very well handmade and easy to ruin. Then she turned around and saw another Greece. Chapter 8 Doubled At first, Gozel thought there was a mirror there, but that wasn't true. There was actually two greases. They were both doing wrong. The other one was drawing on Gozel's best picture she'd worked on, which was the normal grease. Gozel did not like this. How did that other one get there? She felt like blaming Misty. Misty! screamed Gozel angrily. Sugarmess yelled too. Misty appeared. Please make that grease disappear, cried Gozel. I'm not in the mood, Misty. I can't undo spells other fairies do. I didn't do it. Oh, okay, sighed Gozel. Even if Misty did, Grease would still be there to annoy her. Really, Gozel, I don't know how you get into these messes, continued Misty. It's trouble, pure trouble. That Grease drawing on the paper is the Grease that appeared. The other one is real. I can only tell you that, though. I can't do anything else for you. Just then, the clone of Grease stood up, crumpled Gozel's best poster paper up, and threw it and took out her pacifier. Inside the mouthpiece stood another tiny grease. The grease unscrewed the mouthpiece, and the tiny grease stepped out. Another grease came out from the behind the table. Several more greases appeared. Help, help, please, Misty, thought an angry Gozel. Greases were everywhere. Sugarmess stood, frozen. Gozel dodged a grease who was taking apart its pacifier. It threw the pacifier part at the tiny grease, and the mouthpiece to the real grease, and kept the handle announcing that it looked like a rainbow. Gozel caught a grease and brought it into another room. No other greases followed, and this wasn't the real grease. The grease stood still and rubbed her hands together. More greases appeared, faintly at first, then clearer. But now, they were all rubbing their hands together. Gozel let all the greases out and then wondered how she'd do this. She'd try to double herself. She rubbed her hands together, but nothing happened. A grease came up to her and gave her its pacifier. Ew! cried Gozel. But then, a strange thing happened. More Gozels appeared, and also fifty sugar messes. They ran out into the living room to outnumber the greases. They each grabbed a grease. Gozel grabbed the real one, and all the double greases, sugar messes, and Gozels disappeared once she touched her. Gozel and sugar mess were relieved, but not grease. She was shocked. They would never know what kind of fairy did this, but at least it was all done now. Chapter 9, Birthday for Gozel. Sugarmess shook Gozel awake the next morning. She opened her eyes and stared into the hazy morning glow. It was her birthday. She was 12. She went into the living room and found balloons and streamers everywhere. There was even a banner that said, Happy Birthday, Gozel. This was a few years later, by the way. One of her gifts was a horse. It was stuffed and brown, with white socks ending in ebony black hooves. It looked nice enough, but Gozel thought she saw the horse wink and look very troublesome. Gozel happily ate breakfast, and quickly, too, because it was her birthday. Sugarmuff gave her a deep red-colored gown, the color and feel of velvet, perfect rose. Oh, thank you, Sugarmuff, cried Gozel. No problem said Sugarmess. It's from Izza, really, not me. She was too shy to give it to you, Gozel. Where had Izza gotten such a beautiful dress? Why bother give it to her instead of keep such a wonderful thing for herself? That Izza, thought Gozel. She's so interesting. Chapter 10. Misty's Hideout. Gozel's year of being 12 had just started. It was the morning after her birthday, and she stretched and yawned and went to the kitchen, and there, obviously in front of her, she saw it. There was a space between the cupboard and the side of the fridge. The space somehow popped out at her. Soon she realized why. A magic fairy, like Misty, could fit right through it. It was her hideout. At least that was Gozel's immediate thought. As she pondered this, the sound of hooves filled the house. Hooves? Then she remembered that she'd gotten a little horse. It had blinked mischievously and seemed mean. 
She felt scared and alarmed until she heard a loud, ear-splitting neigh. It was horses. Horses that were obviously mean. <coughs> Gazel looked around, then saw a honey-colored horse step toward her into her house and grinned mischievously. Gazel froze and whispered, Don't neigh. The horse leaned close to her ear and neighed. One, two, three, stampede! It said. Then it lifted its hoof. Suddenly the room filled with horses. One pounced on her and neighed in her face. Then it cooed, Hey, sweetie pie, sleep and neigh, sleep and neigh. I'm not tired, yelled Gozzle. Well, miss, it's the horse. Drink this, and aren't you tired? The horse shoved her dirty water in a horse trough, and Gozzle did not want to drink it. It looked gross. It was horse water. Ew. Gozzle refused. No, thank you, said Gozzle. Around her the stampede still raged. I bet I can neigh better than you, said brave Gozzle, because she was mad at the horse and wanted to say something that expressed that and that would make it mad. So let's hear your neigh, laughed the horse, and Gozzle wished she'd picked another topic. Nay, she said flatly. <laughs> Screeched the horse. I do better neigh. The horse reared up, kicked, and neighed. Stampede they did, and Gozzle just wanted to escape. She got up and went outside into her big backyard and lay down, relaxing. She then began to suddenly fly. She drifted through the blue sky and flew past Misty. Misty pounced on her and snapped, Gozzle, I said right in front of you, Gozzle must not fly. Whatever, shoo, Misty, Gozzle blurted out, not making any sense. But Misty laughed and shoved Gozzle. Gozzle fell, and she didn't know where she landed. Misty successfully flew away, singing, Ha ha, Gozzle! A house stood near Gozzle, and Gozzle was curious about it. Chapter 11, Sonora's Lightning. A beautiful girl suddenly bolted out of the small cottage. She had short, dark hair, cut to her shoulders, and was slightly taller than Gozzle. She looked shocked as she turned toward the side of the house. Two much older girls were leading away a beautiful black stallion. The horse looked unsure as the girls were handling him very roughly. W what are you doing? cried the dark-haired girl. The two older girls looked up, startled. Um, we're... One started. Selling lightning, said the other one bravely. Anyone would want a nice steed like him. Yeah, said the dark-haired girl. Like me? Sonora, you shouldn't be diving like that. It's not safe. We're far better than you, and you know it. We deserve lightning, but if you won't let us have him, someone else definitely will, said one of the older girls. The dark-haired girl, Sonora, looked horror-struck, and she rushed towards her horse. The horse reared, bucking wildly, until he broke free of the two girls' grasp on his reins. Sonora jumped onto the horse's back and cantered away, sweating and panting. Basil was unsure what to do, so she followed Sonora's horse, her legs aching horribly. When the girl stopped, Gozzle was relieved, and she ran up to her, saying, What was that? H who are you? I'm Sonora Webster, said the girl. I dive horses. Dive horses? Puzzled Gozzle. Yeah, he said. It's a sport. You go onto this platform thing and the horse follows you and then you get onto it and the horse jumps and dives into the water. Wow, cried Gozzle in disbelief. Diving horses. My performance is on Friday, said the girl. Want to see it then? Of course, said Gozzle. All right, said Sonora. Stay with me till Friday. On Friday, Gozzle sat on the bleachers and watched Sonora mount lightning. She rode him up to the edge of the platform and leapt gracefully into the sparkling water. The crowd gasped. Gozzle ooed and awed happily. You're amazing, Sonora, cried Gozzle when she came up to her a while later. Thank you, Sonora whispered, and they went off back to her house. Sonora's house was small, simple, and comfortable. Gozzle was happy to be there. Sonora told her where her guest room was, and she went and dropped off her things on her little bed. Chapter 12, Gozzle's Surprise. That night, it was dark in her room, and she was nearly asleep when her door banged open. Something whizzed out of the hallway and into her room. She sat up and looked around, but she couldn't see anything, just her room all around her. Then, light flooded in suddenly. Someone had flipped the switch on, 
A cat, the color of the sky at morning, leapt up onto her, purring and twitching its tail. Then a girl, riding a horse, stepped in. Gosel gasped. She had red, curly hair and bright red freckles and blue eyes. It was Sugar Mess. Sugar Mess dismounted and rushed to Gosel. Gosel, she sobbed. I found you. I've brought someone with me that may save you. She knows a very important and wise trick. It will save you someday. But Sugar Mess, how long have you been searching? You're very strong and loyal if you... Oh, never mind, she said airily. Just meet Ginger. Gosel smiled, but she had just noticed that her cat had gone. Where had it gone? Where? It was nowhere to be seen. Ginger, it turned out, was the horse. She was really a girl, but knew how to turn into a horse. How? asked Gosel. It's simple, she explained. Turn around twice and really believe you're a horse, and it will happen. Gosel had looked up at the ceiling and suddenly saw the most beautiful sight she'd ever seen. The ceiling was glowing with light all of a sudden. Gosel saw that it was the light, changing colors and making the room change color. First, it was yellow for four minutes, then red for eight minutes, then green for twelve minutes, and then blue for sixteen minutes. Then, suddenly, Ginger was gone, and there was a chestnut mare in the room. The chestnut mare was in the place that Ginger was before. The mare was Ginger. Gosel ran out. She was so terrified of this girl that could turn into a horse. Even though she knew that she was probably just magical, and it was no problem, the book Black Beauty lay on the floor. She jumped, attempting to jump over it, and fell through. Help! she cried. No fear, no fear, I'm right here. Gosel jumped. She was on the grass, and peering over her was a black horse. We'd better get you back soon, he said. I am Black Beauty. You are Black Beauty the horse? asked Gosel. We must get you away from the mouse horse, said Black Beauty. The mouse horse peeked at Gosel. It neighed. <coughs> it crept over and said, Hop on, horse isn't dangerous. Before anyone could stop her, she was on the mouse horse. Now, it said in the creepiest voice ever heard, You get a nice, slow ride. Cool, she said. Suddenly, she was lying on the ground. She had been thrown off the mouse horse. A book called Stampede was lying nearby. The mouse horse pushed her in. Suddenly, the loud clomp of hooves filled the air. Look at my beautiful hooves! Black beauties! Horses were all around, and Misty was leading them. Up, toward that child. Forward stampede, she yelled. A horse lay on her and yelled. Hey, sweetie, want to ride? Just then, a protective hoof lay on her shoulder. Get on me, ride horse. So Gosel rode horse, but never enjoyed it. Suddenly, Misty pushed Gosel off as the horses trampled Gosel. But the horse, again, boosted her on. Please gallop, cried Gosel. She fell off horse and landed inside a book called Mystery Fairies. She was so afraid. Chapter 13, Mystery Fairies. Why, Gosel, you can fly, said a familiar voice. Ginger, how is it that you could be a mare? How can you be in here? I could turn into one easily, replied Ginger. As for being in this book, I followed your path. I knew that I had to save you when you fell into Black Beauty because of that mouse horse that fell out of that book stampede into Black Beauty. You know, that's always a problem, that mouse horse. But how could you do that? asked Gosel. How could you be a mare? You nay, replied Ginger. You nay? whispered Gosel. That's right, cried Ginger. You nay. Gosel was puzzled, but Ginger went on. You nay. But it has to be a perfect neigh. You also, as I told you before, have to think, really know that you are a horse. Believing, turn around twice and rear up. Then, you are a horse. Gosel stared. She blinked. Ginger was turning into a horse. She reared and galloped away, waving a hoof. 
She followed Ginger until they whizzed back through all the books. But now they were in black beauty. She watched while she saw a man with a horse hooked to a carriage. The horse galloped and neighed. He cantered and suddenly stopped and reared, neighing a sea of uncontrollable neighs. Then, in front of them, was the boniest mare. The bony thing looked the black horse right in the eye and opened its mouth wide. It screeched, Beauty and I have married you! It tried again. Have you ever read maze? And it tried once more. Black Beauty Days! Is that you, Mere Mare? Ginger? said the black horse. What has gotten into you? Gozzle was frightened. She was very frightened. She was frightened of that mare, that bony horse, and wanted to get out. But the bony mare kept running toward her. The bony horse trotted right in front of Gozzle. Then, without thinking, the mare lifted its hoof with both hands. Gozzle grabbed the hoof and yelled, You have beautiful hooves! The mare kicked frantically, trying to get loose. Gozzle let go as the mare's eyes set on her. But it wasn't a horrible, rude eye. It was a gentle, kind eye, full of love, care, and sorrow. The bony mare whispered as not to make her screechy voice be heard. She said, Who are you? I'm Ginger. I must trot away. Bye-bye, uh, Miss Eeyore. And Eeyore. Gozzle. She walked off and said a neigh. Then she bounded away and said again, <laughs> This was strange, thought Gozzle. Chapter 14 Summer. School was getting out. It was getting more mellow every day. One day, Gozzle had to watch a movie about maps and then tell how she liked it and why the longitude and latitude was vertical or horizontal and what it did. This was hard. Then the next day, they must do a word study thing about syllables. Syllables were very easy and Gozzle caught on easily. Then, as days went by, it got simpler. Not as much as the work, but it was a lot easier to complete. Less and less things were due as tests went by. Finally, summer was here, and there was a big math test to show what you know. Ismaliki met Gozzle at the bikes and shouted at her, I bet you will get a zero on your math show what you know test, Gozzle. You'll never guess what 50 times 8 is or 8 times 10. Gozzle knew those. They were easy. Chapter 15, The Big Day. At last, the math day came. Ismaliki looked all dressed up. She had cuffs on her nice shirt and with a big floofy skirt, beautiful, and of course, Ismaliki smiled. She told Gozzle that she was dressed up for the victory of the test. She even said she'd do it faster than everyone else. When the test time came, Gozzle took the math. She took a deep breath and wrote, eight, eight times, times 50, 50 is 80. 80. No, that was not right. She wrote again, 50, 50 times, times 8, 8 is 400. 400. Next problem, 18, 18 times, times 5 is 90. Ismaliki was turning hers in. Gozzle worked out four more. Hurry up, Gozzle! yelled Ismoki. Hush, Iza, whispered the teacher. Gozzle's taking a test and so is everybody else. You shouldn't be done right now. Iza, I suggest that you go back and check your work. Iza just laughed loudly. I know everything, she yelled. Then hush, Iza. 16, 16 times, times 5 is 80. 80. 7 times 0, zero. What, what is 0? 70 times 6 is 420. 60 times 7 is 420. Then she was done. But she saw Ismaliki. Done! As she was walking past Ismaliki, sitting at her desk, Ismaliki scowled at Gozzle. Gozzle heard something like, Done? Late? Why? Just a slowpoke at math? Slowpoke Gozzle? Slow Gozzle? Slozzle? Slozzle? Her voice was rising now, and she was yelling. All the other kids looked up at Gozzle, too. Everyone was done but Gozzle. She was the last to turn hers in. At recess, Ismaliki got lots of people to go out and cheer, But, a few days later, the math tests were graded. Seeing her grades, she gasped. Her grade was an A+, and she squinted at Iza's. It was a zero. She saw Ismolki's tears and angriness when she saw it. The math got scribbled on all around the sheet of Iza's, and there were no problems done. It was barely touched with the pencil. Chapter 16. Donkeys. A few things were confusing to Gozzle. First, there was a hoof print of mud on the nice, freshly wiped and mopped floor. 
What would her mother say? Just then, she opened the closet door, and a donkey stepped out and announced its appearance with a loud, vibrating bray. Just then, there came a knock on the door. The door was being opened by Gozzle, and suddenly, there was a sound like a stampede, and billions of donkeys ran in. One donkey stayed outside. Gozzle wanted to be free of all the hooves, so she went out to that one donkey left outside. Gozzle was riding her all around when she felt she must go inside. She found herself surrounded by donkeys, calm donkeys. But as soon as they saw Gozzle, they all started to stampede again. Gozzle had an idea. She went outside again and ignored the braying inside. Then, as if by magic, the donkeys all calmly stopped and relaxed. <coughs> that is, every donkey stopped except one. That one was a very bony donkey. <coughs> it brayed so horribly that it ran out the door and then it saw Gozzle. It began to stampede even more as it saw her. Gozzle began to run, but wherever she went, the troubled donkeys went also. Finally, she grabbed the long-eared donkey in front of her and straddled it. It ran so fast. It ran as fast as it could. Gozzle held on. It ran like it had never run before. Finally, they reached a thing, a place. It seemed old, and to see a real place like it was so fascinating. It was a carousel, but with real animals. Beyond it was a whole fair of just animal rides. Gozzle hopped off the donkey, while the donkey kept running. The donkey ran away from Gozzle into a pen that said, World's, World's Best, Best Donkey. Donkey. A very rude donkey pushed all the animals and donkeys out of the cart. Then that donkey looked at Gozzle. She was sitting on top of a huge rabbit that was real. It wasn't plastic. It was a true rabbity rabbit. The rabbit was flying, and Gozzle was clinging to the rabbity rabbit and riding the rabbity rabbit. Behind the ride, flying Fly rabbit. rabbit. There was another. It was pony, pony rides. rides. And ride, ride a, a monkey. monkey. There was the real, real animal, animal carousel. carousel. And... Who's, Who's got, got my hay? hay? And turtle. turtle. And ride a goat. goat. And lots more. Gozzle was flying on the rabbit, and she was having lots and lots of fun. The donkeys were now heading for the ticket booth. They screeched about their hoof. and brayed until one donkey put sixty dollars on the ticket booth. I'm sorry, said the manager, but we do not allow donkeys. Once we did, but not anymore. They leave hoof prints and scatter hay all over the rides. One time, the whirly twirly bear, who retired, even tried to catch a donkey, but it whizzed away. One day, our old motor of our Ferris wheel got jammed up, and do you know what was jamming it? Hay. The donkeys brayed and neighed. Chapter 17, Prize Donkey. The donkey in the box that said something like, World's World Best, Best donkey, donkey, that donkey had a blue ribbon. The loudspeaker of the fair said loudly, We, we will now proudly announce the world's greatest donkey! The world's greatest donkey will now pull this beautiful cart. Do you understand, donkey? The donkey was hitched against the cart. The old bony donkey pulled and pulled. The donkey trudged along, slowly pulling it. <laughs> cried the loudspeaker. Suddenly that donkey stood up. He wasn't old. He wasn't bony. He was going lightning speed, practically flying over the audience. The donkey pulled the cart. Lightning speed. The audience gasped. 
<gasps> the donkey said into the microphone, I am a truly fast donkey. I am the greatest of all donkeys. If you all want to talk to donkey, make a line right here and talk to donkey. Grozzle got in line. Another girl was behind her and one girl was in front, standing with her brother in front. The girl in back said, what a beautiful donkey. I'll tell that donkey that I'd love to learn how to bray. Yeah, said Gozzle, a real, live, incredible speaking donkey. The girl in front said, yeah, great, isn't he? He's an awesome donkey, said her brother. He's unbelievable. When the girl and her brother came to the front of the line, the girl said, I'm Melissa, and this is my brother Aiden, and we've come to ask, we've come for some donkey rides. Two horses appeared beside donkey. This is Nay and Old Gray. They'll give you rides. I'm Busy Bray. Gozzle came forward. May I have a pet donkey, she asked. Donkey said, yes, here, he is trained. Gozzle jumped and left the donkey in the box that said, world's, world's greatest, greatest donkey. donkey. Because the only reason she'd ask that donkey that is to see if he'd answer. The girl in back of Gozzle stepped up. May I learn to bray? Asked the girl. A person? Bray? Sneered the donkey. I just love to bray. Let's hear your bray, grumped donkey. The girl brayed. Ugh, what a nasty bray. Ugh, ugh. Gozzle said she'd help her. The donkey was so rude. Chapter 18. This, this is, is written, written with, with a hook. hook. After Gozzle had taught the girl to bray perfectly, they had departed. Clarice, the girl said, Thank you, Gozzle. Thank you so much. You're welcome, replied Gozzle. Well, after that, Gozzle left the fair. The donkeys were so entertained they didn't notice her at all. Seeing the donkey bray, she quickly left. But with Gozzle not knowing it, the donkey followed her. We all know how all donkeys bray. Well, some donkeys do this bray process, but not all donkeys. Well, as Gozzle was walking in a grassy field, she had one suspicious thought. The donkey might be close by her. Finally, she began looking at her shadow, and she almost fainted when she saw a tail on her shadow. Two long ears poked up on her shadow. She put a hand on her back where the tail shadow was, but there was no tail. Gozzle turned around. The donkey was right in her face and then began to bray in her ear. Chapter 19 a dried old creek. The donkey's loud bray made her shriek, and then she fell backwards. She experienced a fall. She expected to fall on the grass, or sidewalk, or leaves, or even the river, which she was scared of. But no. When she fell, blackness closed over Gozzle. When she woke up, for she had passed out, she found herself in a dried old creek. She stood up, smiled, and climbed out. A family walked by. The mother smiled. Hello, little sweet girl, she said. There were four girls. One was nineteen, one was twelve, one was fifteen, and one was eighteen. The eighteen-year-old girl said, Would you like to pick something from my purse? She opened her purse, pouring out fabulous things. Falling into a dried old creek was quite a real shock, I tell you. Y yes explained Gozzle, for I fell into that dried old creek, and I— The creek? The whole family asked at once. Chapter 20. The Girl's Things. Yes, the dried old creek, said Gozzle. Are you okay? asked the fifteen-year-old girl. I'm sorry. I'm Sherry, and she's 19, and she's Olivia. She's 12, and she's Angela, and she's 18, and her name is Cynthia. Angela frowned. Sherry said, oh, yes, and her name is Kelly. Yes, thank you, and I'm 20, said a voice beside them. No one pays any attention to me. The girl stepped out from, well, she sort of appeared out of the air. Then another girl jumped up into the air. Hi, Kelly Clarkson, said the young girl. That name sounded, well, very familiar. Kelly Clarkson was a famous dance singer, but was it really her? How had she just appeared out of nowhere? Chapter 21, Kelly and Cinda. Gozzle waved to the family, eventually, and said, What? Where did you come from? The young girl said, Well, you are Kelly Clarkson, right? Well, she's Kelly, I mean. And I'm Leah, preferred Kelly, because she is totally awesome. And we came from a world you would not understand. Who are you? Gozzle, said Gozzle. Gozzle Thundermas? Why, yes, how'd you know? I'm not famous or anything. The girl stared. Are you kidding? Gozzle Thundermas, you're real. I wrote stories about you. Gozzle the real Gozzle. 
You rode to Misty, then took her invisible powder. You survived a horse stampede. You have a pet squirrel. You've, you've done everything. Where were you born? Leah shrieked. Gozel answered. I, I was born in a, in a, a world of complete confusion. Leah, Kelly, and Gozel did not know what they would do next. Leah seemed to be all over Kelly. Kelly seemed to be very patient. She smiled at everyone calmly, and even when Leah went crazy. Let's walk off. Come on, Gozel, said Kelly. A white horse, trotting across the field, came closer and closer. Her name was Cinda. They could tell by the name embroidered on the bridle. Chapter 22. The Mean Notes. Walking toward them, the white mare suddenly began to trot. Then she galloped, and then... Her legs gave out, and she stumbled. They all rushed as fast as they could to Cinda. They frantically touched Cinda and rubbed her, and even Gozel ran down to the dried old creek, which still had drops of water in it, and poured the drops over Cinda. But the horse was completely still. Suddenly, everyone had an awful feeling and knew what it was. The horse had just passed out, out of nowhere, because she was a tired old horse. They felt that a tiny sense of breathing was coming. Kelly carefully touched the horse again. Leah did too, and quickly they drew back. The white horse was quiet and laying there. They must leave the horse alone, they thought, until she woke up and recovered. This must be her home. Poor old Cinda, though. Gozel suddenly screamed. She touched Cinda again. Then she patted her to make sure that she would wake up soon. Then, without a word, she ran over the fields, past the donkey, and to her house. Grease was ready for her. A note was on her desk. It said, Wishes. Wishes. Time, Time without, without you. you. Gozel crossed out the out in without and went about her way. The next day, notes kept coming. I, I wish I, I wasn't, wasn't you. you. Rude, Rude rabbit, rabbit, you smell. You, you are, are not, not a princess, princess I am. I'm, I'm going, going to, to scream. scream. Finally, Gozel hid in the shadows to find out who was writing those mean notes to her sister. Finally, a girl looking like Grease came out and wrote a bad but long story about the real Greek. Gozel knew it was a double Grease, so she sneaked up behind it and very gently caught the grease. The grease said, just as if it were the real grease, Hey, Gizzle! I'm Rizzle this moo! What? said Gozzle. Gozzle sighed and simply called Misty over to make the grease disappear. Then a knock came on the door. Chapter 23, The Fairy. Gozzle wondered who it was, then opened it. There stood a fairy, screaming loudly. It stepped in. They walked into the living room. I am the fairy, Gozzle who made the greases appear. The double greases, you know. I'm very upset that you made my creations disappear. I worked hard on them. I made another one, just now, and you made it disappear. Gozel was not very mad at the fairy. She didn't care. The fairy was weird. Suddenly the fairy reached down and picked up Gozel. The fairy spun around, and it threw Gozel onto the couch. Gozel wasn't even hurt. She just stared at the fairy and said, You have strange punishments, fairy. Please, you are weird. Just go away, fairy. No, said the fairy. Fine. I'm very tired, though, fairy. I'm going to bed. That made the fairy leave. She went out, got into her silver car, and drove away. As she drove around the corner, Gozel was very happy to see her go. When she woke up in the morning, after she'd have a good after she'd had a good night's sleep, she remembered her weird dream that the fairy had picked her up again and tossed her into the back seat of its car. She looked around. Where was she? She felt a jolt of fear. There was a knock on the door, and she pulled it open. The fairy came in, scowling. She picked up Gozel and flung her in her car again. You know, that's your punishment, said the fairy. That's what I did to you, so that you would wake up and not know where you were. How fierce, said Gozel. She had now recovered all the way from her fear. You are a strange fairy. You give strange punishment, said Gozel. Chapter 24 School Gozel Summer was getting very boring, so she was signed up for a summer school. The choices were milk a cow and moo class. Gozel chose Moo class. The first day was quite different for Gozel. Hello, my name is Mrs. Moo. Here is my assistant, Mrs. Moo Moo, said the teacher. Mrs. Moo looked like a very normal human being compared to everyone else in the class, with wavy blonde hair and a dress. Mrs. Moo Moo looked very weird. 
She looked old, with very, very frizzy hair, and very frail. She even smelled old. She looked old, she seemed old, she was old, she sounded old. And even when she mooed, which was a lot, then she sounded old. It sounded like this. Ew. The room was full of twins. There were even triplets. Gozel, as far as she could tell, was the only girl that was not a twin. They all went outside because Mrs. Moo said there was another guest coming. A silver car drove up, and guess what? Misty got out. The fairy was driving it. It beckoned her over, and she came. It said, I'm picking you up after school, you know. I know you walked by yourself to get here. Gozel scowled at the fairy and tried to think of how she could evade the fairy picking her up after school. Gozel stalked off, and as she left, the fairy threw something at her. Open that when you get to class, she said. Was this another punishment? There was also a card from the fairy to Misty. Then Gozel turned her head and left, away from the fairy. When class was over, a silver card drove up. Gozel ran with fear as fast as she could, away, but she felt magic, invisible magic, pulling her back, and the fairy grabbed her. Gozel sat in the back with Misty. Misty looked at the unopened package in Gozel's hands. You did not open that, Gozel! yelled the fairy. Open it now! I'm kind of afraid it will explode on me, said Gozel. It's nothing bad, Gozel, said the fairy. I forgot to open the package in class, she said to the fairy. As an excuse, another excuse, that is, and opened it. Inside there was a note. The note said, Dear God, we are driving to our house. I got you a potion for making anything grow hands and feet and come to life. It won't work on stuffed animals, food, or anything already living. Cars don't do it either. Love the fairy. Uh, why did you do this, fairy? yelled Gozel. This is strange. The potion was also in the package. Also, there was a note which said, Here's, Here's some information, information about which, which things, things can, can come, come to life and which ones, ones can't. I don't know, said Gozel. This sounds kind of strange. You put in like two lists. This is scary. At that moment, the fairy turned the car into the driveway of its house. Gozel sighed, and as she was thrown into her guest room, she had no idea what to do. Chapter 25 Bedtime for Gozel The fairy came in and said, Time for bed. I know that it's nine o'clock at night and Gozel usually stays up till twelve. The fairy threw Gozel into her bed. Gozel closed her eyes and began to dream. But when she woke up, she saw something. Something that made her heart beat. Something that she didn't want to see ever. Next door, Misty was up to no good. Gozel sneaked up to the room to see what she was doing. What she saw scared her. Misty was feeding a cheetah. She was snuggling it and letting it bite her. And on Misty's bed lay a very large cat, big enough to ride. Also, in the driveway, there was another car. Suddenly, the other car's door opened, and a dog stepped out of the driver's seat. It walked on two paws. Gozel ran into Misty's bedroom and climbed right up upon the large cat. It meowed and said, Meow! I have a giant flea! Meow! Mistress! Mistress! Meow! It kept on screaming, Mistress! But Misty just stood there. The big cat Meow! looked around. When it saw that Gozel was on it, the cat ran outside to the dog. The dog quickly got on four paws and sat. Gozel leapt off the huge cat, <coughs> meowed, and just sat there. Still. She went to the dog, who was big enough to ride too, and looked at the collar. It said Hollywood. The dog sniffed her, and then Gozel cautiously got onto the dog's back. The dog started to run. Large animals were everywhere. Even a wildebeest. Even, believe it or not, a bug. A very large, rideable bug. Gozel rode on all of them. Then, right in the middle of riding the dog, it barked and jumped, so Gozo flew off. She landed in the middle of a beautiful world. There was a meadow of flowers and a path leading up to a castle. A white horse and carriage were tethered up outside. Lots of girls on horses were riding around on the field. Over the meadow, there was a few black cows grazing. Gozel naturally just started walking up to the castle. 
She came to the door and saw the guard was a pretty girl with a gold sword and gentle but fierce blue eyes. She rode on a prancing, a prancing white unicorn. Gozel went up to her. What is this place? asked Gozel. The girl dismounted her unicorn and said, You, my dear, are in Babyland. The baby fairy lives in the castle. The unicorn said, Please. Then it screeched about how beautiful its hoof was. My hoof, my hoof, oh, my beautiful hoof, look at my beautiful hoof, look at my hoof, it's so beautiful, it's shiny and it shimmers in the sunlight, and it's shiny, it's like crystal, it's a white hoof, just like, you know, horses' hooves are not normally white, they're black hooves, but look at my hoof, look at my hoof. Uni, please don't talk nonsense about your hoof. Uni said, my hoof. Gozel went into the castle, the guard had let her. Gozel walked up into the hallway, and a girl fell in step beside her. I am Ivy, she said. Ivy. Gozel smiled at her. She was very pretty. Suddenly, Ivy stared at someone. Gozel followed her gaze. There was Ismolki, dressed in pure finery. Hey, Gozel, want to go over to my house? Friend, she asked. How would they get to Ismolki's house from here? Well, if Ismolki was in the castle, she must know. Chapter 26 Gozel's Friend's Surprises Gozel walked a short distance with Ismolki to Ismolki's apartment, and it was so surprising to realize how short it was. Her apartment was only a few doors away. Ismolki is writing a book about her. It was called, It Was All Because of Ismolki's Dog. Izzo's dog was what it was called until she changed the title. Gozel didn't know which dog it was, all because of. The old shaky small dog that chews on everything, or the brown dog that is big enough to ride that is a boxer who is mean. Ismolki had both dogs. They both did bite, and they both were mean. Gozel had a kind, sweet, white dog. Her name was Fairest. She also had a dark brown dog named Ginger. When Gozel went into Ismolki's house, a boxer came toward her and nipped at the rug. Fairest was on a leash beside Gozel. She had picked her up before she went to Ismolki's house, because she thought she needed comfort and protection, just a little, from those mean dogs. She led Fairest inside. A large poodle was walking around. Ismolki told Gozel where the kitchen, bathroom, and guest bedrooms were. Did she intend for Gozel to stay for days? She went into one room. The floor was green now, but Ismolki pushed a button on the wall and the floor turned blue, then yellow. It turned all the colors of the rainbow. Wow. Ismolki also showed her a room where you could change it to whatever room or place you could ever think of. Just type in right here and push the appear button and it'll change, said Ismolki, pointing to a laptop on the counter. I bet you can't make a park with a bunch of rides up here in a room, said Gozel. Bet I can, said Ismolki, and typed in amusement, amusement park. park. The room stayed a room with walls and a ceiling and lights and a carpet floor, but in the room, there were a lot of rides. Gozel climbed on a carousel, and the carousel had 96 horses. Hey, want to try it? asked Ismolki. Gozel rode a white unicorn with wings that was all plastic, going up and down, until Gozel said, Hey, Izzo, look! Izzo was the name Gozel called Ismolki. Ismolki looked, and she couldn't believe what she saw. Ferris was typing wildly on the laptop of the room, and now... It said, World of the Dogs. The dog pushed enter. How did the smart dog know? Millions of dogs filled the room. <laughs> Gozel laughed and smiled. Ismolki said, Let's try World of Math. She typed it. Suddenly the room changed. Math numbers swirled around. Time signs, division symbols, plus signs and minus signs, everything also floated around. Ismolki caught a three, and Gogol caught a five. Then they put the three down, then the five, and it made a thirty-five. Wow, Iza, said Gozel. We can do anything. Let's go to... Hmm. Let's go to World of... said Ismolki, also thinking. Let's see fairies, said Gozel. Let's see weird stories, said Izza. Weird stories, thought Gozel. Chapter 27, Weird Fairies. I know, said Izza. Let's go to the world of weird fairies. Weird fairies, Gozel asked. Like the bug fairy? Yep, said Izza, and she typed it. 
Weird fairies. Fairies with ladybug wings appeared. There was also a skinny fairy with butterfly wings, a plump fairy with sun wings, and a pegasus with angel wings. Sun wings are wings that sparkle in the sun, and they're usually found on horses with wings and drawings of them. The pegasus, however, that appeared, the horse with wings, in other words, had wings like an angel would usually have on them. That was very interesting, said Gozel. Is this house really a small apartment, or is it all your own? Is it a mansion? Is it yours? Yes, it is, said Ismolki. Rich Ismolki. She got everything. A huge mansion. All hers. Well, at least Gozel could see it. But it was huge from the inside. And from the outside, it was just a tiny apartment. She watched Iza go into a room, and then Gozel heard something in the room go... I, I wish, wish for a wish, wish and, and wish is a wish, wish and do is a do and would do wish. Gozel didn't go in. She was confused. Iza came out and handed Gozel an envelope. This is for you. It's just a tiny little as ever, but I hope you'll like it. Present. Gozel opened the envelope. It was a trillion dollar bill. Another. 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 There were ten trillion dollar bills in there. Sorry it's so small, said Ismolki. So small? asked Gozel. So small? That's not small, Iza. Really? You're so rich, Iza. Hope you like it, said Ismolki. I love it, thanks, Iza, said Gozel. But are you sure? Yeah, said Iza. I have lots more. She guessed they were trillionaires. Maybe even so rich they were the richest people in the whole world. Still, Gozel thought, she was very kind and generous. What would she do with this? Thank you, Iza. She patted Ismolki and hugged her, not because of the money, but because of what a sacrifice that was, and what a good friend she was to Gozel. Chapter 28, Colby Calais. Gozel went into the room that she had heard that wish for a wish noise. She found a pot that said, Say your wish out loud, and then it will come true. The pot talked. The dresser laughed heartily. You can make any wish you like, Gozel. I wish Colby Calais would come to my house and visit and sing to me, to everyone. Then I'll sing for her. Your wish is granted, right, Wandrew? Asked the dresser. The pot said, Yes, yes. your wish is granted, Gozel. Also, Wandrew, began Gozel. Her name is Wandrew, Gozel, said the dresser. Yes, well, Wandrew, why did you say the rhyme that goes... Um, I wish for a wish, and wish is a wish, and do is a do, and moo wish. To Ismolki? Asked the pot. Yes, to Ismolki, said Gozel. She, she wished, wished for ten trillion dollar bills for you. I only say that rhyme to experienced wishers. She said. Oh, said Gozel, that is why. She left and thanked Wandru and that dresser. Gozel left and thanked Ismolki a million times. At Gozel's own house, a knock came on the door. <laughs> Colby Calais was here. Gozel's wish had come true. She smiled and let her in. I'm famous and you'll never be, said Colby Calais. That doesn't sound like you, sighed Gozel. I wasn't shining the last time I saw you. Really? Colby, can you be on my side today? You really don't sound like you. Gozel? said Colby. I am a celebrity now. I am growing up. I am not going to be with girls anymore who need help being famous. All right, Colby, you can go on. Colby would always be in the same inside, almost. Gozel had met Colby before, in a concert, twice, and had known her and talked to her for a while, and she had been the kindest person ever. But now... Gozel had no idea who she had turned into, and it had only been a couple years. Chapter 29 Concerts The next day, Colby Calais left to be at a concert exactly at 12.30. She had defined several times she needed to be there. Gozel followed her. She tried not to let Colby see her, but it was fall, and the leaves crackled under her shoes. Colby turned and stared. She turned and held her hand, saying, Come on, Gozel. You don't want to let me go. You can watch me sing. You're lucky. Never mind. I am famous and you'll never be, said Gozel. Colby sighed and left. Gozel was just being mocking, and she was sorry the minute that she'd said it. Gozel followed Colby anyway. The quick concert was a walk so quickly. 
like two minutes. She began singing, and everybody got up to leave. Colby was singing like a frog. Tears shone in her eyes, and her face was all blotchy and blushing. That's not Colby Calais, everybody mumbled and stared at her. Even a three-year-old girl wandered onto the stage and asked, Colby, are you famous? Colby started to cry. On stage, she looked like the opposite of Colby Calais, the famous, shy, beautiful singer. The instrumental music played without a voice to guide it, so Gosel stepped in, singing hard and long. She knew the song, and it was perfect. If you just realize what I just realized, then we'd be perfect for each other. We'd never find another just to realize what I just realized. We never have to wonder if we missed out on each other now. Colby hurried off stage and went to Gosel. Before she could pull Gosel away or the microphone out of Gosel's hands, Gosel hurried onto the stage the full way still singing. Colby whispered, Gosel, get down, run. Why, said Gosel, just before the newspaper reporter snapped a picture of Gosel. I'm not Colby Calais, yelled Gosel, and then continued singing. Who is, said the reporter. She is, said Gosel, gesturing to Colby. Colby ran before the reporter snapped her picture. Gosel whistled. Fairest, she said. Fairest, her white dog came running toward her and then toward Colby. Colby ran to her horse. Ferris chased her, and so did Gosel. Colby rode as fast as she could. Gosel ran as fast as she could. Gosel climbed onto another horse, just standing by the roadside, and caught up with Colby. This was Colby Calais, a girl who loved to be famous, to sing. She had earned her right to be on stage. She had conquered stage fright. She won prizes, a faithful friend, beautiful, famous, fashionable, but Gosel didn't see Colby as herself. Not now, no, never had she been like this. Everyone, totally confused now, left the concert. When they were at Gosel's house, Colby asked to spend the night, too weary to keep running away. Of course, Miss Calais, replied Gosel. For some reason, Maybe because of the way she was acting differently tonight, or because she was tired, she didn't know. But for some reason anyway, Gosel thought she saw something in Colby that she hadn't felt before. Chapter 30 Realize, Gosel. The next morning, Colby was in her room talking to her. She was saying, of course you'll have to wait about three to four years to go to American Idol. How come you're not acting like yourself like yesterday? I don't know what you're talking about, said Colby. I'm as famous and myself as always. That Misty Fairy can't stand being on stage. She has terrible stage fright. I am growing up, like I told you, but now I'm fine. Suddenly, it all crashed over Gosel. Colby, that she had seen yesterday, was actually Misty. Misty was disguised as Colby, but the true Colby had never been at that concert. She had arrived that night on account of Gosel's wish. She hadn't said that day. She had just said that she wished that Colby would come over. Oh, Colby, please listen, sighed Gosel, collapsing onto her. You missed a whole, a whole entire concert. Misty pretended to be you. Gosel was sobbing so hard that she was unable to make any sense talking. She was barely able to even form words. I mean, she was pretending to be you. Colby understood. Now, she said in a whisper, let's get that Misty. Gosel followed Colby into the living room, and there sat, still disguised Misty. Colby sat next to Misty and said, How are you, Colby? Great. How are you, Go- You're not Gosel. Then Misty turned. Then she turned directly away and back again, staring. Let me hear your voice, said the real Colby to Misty. Misty made a sound like, <coughs> <laughs> Dear Misty, said Gosel, and then Misty made another girl, like Colby Calais, appear. She was really the Tooth Fairy. This was going to be interesting. The Tooth Fairy? The Tooth Fairy began to be herself again and not Colby. 
the disguise was already fading away. Gosel was very shy by now. She had no idea what to say. She was in a room with an enchantress that she knew, disguised as Colby Calais, that she knew was Misty, the Tooth Fairy, and the real Colby. This was going to be awkward. Her dark eyes and gentle ways didn't seem duplicated at all in Misty. Colby got up. It was seeming to be too much for her. So she was going to the door to leave. Gosel clung to her and followed her. Colby turned and said, I won't be as hard and mean as that Misty and won't send you away. You could come with me to my true concert. Colby, said Gosel, you're better than Misty. Misty was shoe. Shoe sometimes mean an insult to mean animals. Only to mean animals you were supposed to say to them. So, Misty was shoe. Gosel loved being with Colby, and Misty had just spoiled everything. I'm better than Misty, said Colby. Gosel told Colby, well, people aren't better than other people, but you are nicer than Misty. Gosel thanked Colby, and Colby left. But whenever you want to see me, and have me here, then shout dream power. Dream power? asked Gosel. Shout dream power, said Colby. It'll work? said Gosel. Of course it'll work. You wished me here. Wishes have everlasting power once you shout dream power, and they'll pretty much happen again. She left, but she was so lucky. Gosel sighed. The best day in a long time had happened with Gosel. The Tooth Fairy and Misty disappeared, both of them. Chapter 31 Happy Gosel Gosel woke up the next morning so happily that she forgot that the sweet and unhealthy fairies would visit Gosel. The unhealthy fairy came first to Gosel. She plumped herself down and complained that Gosel did not have a gray greyhound dog that was old. Do you? said Gosel. Do you have a greyhound that's gray and long and lanky and old? Yes, said the fairy. It looks like this. She drew a picture of it. Then she said she would show her a picture. The picture showed a long, skinny dog that was a greyhound and its tail hung down. The picture looked exactly the same, except that the dog's mouth was open and slobber was dripping all over the place. Gosel even thought that she saw drops of slobber on the camera lens as it was so close in the picture. The unhealthy fairy showed Gosel a picture of each of the dogs she had. Four dogs. A very weird looking long teeny tiny dog and which was really adorable and a really cute dog that was a basset hound dog and a teeny tiny little poodle dog and a different kind of dog that was really adorable and small and really short with wavy fur. Well, what do you want to do? Gosel asked her. Well, how about looking through your closet and cupboards and see if you have any sweets? Horror struck Gosel. She stared at her. At that moment, a knock sounded at the door. The sweet fairy burst in, crying out, Oh no, you don't, unhealthy fairy! Oh, I meant no harm, hummed the fairy, flapping her wings. Come soon and you'll see Ray's a dog. Come over to my house. With that, the fairy took off, flapping her gray wings very quickly. They hummed like a hummingbird's wings. Sweet the sweet fairy tossed her blonde hair and, and said that she could never find a plastic pink barbie shoe. Gosel thought that was a little strange. She told her to sit down and have some treats. She did sit down, right on top of Gosel. Then she disappeared. Chapter 32. Raise a dog. Gosel found herself very bored the next day. She decided she wanted to go visit Raise a Dog and the Unhealthy Fairy, but the Unhealthy Fairy had not given her any address. Unhealthy Fairy, said Gosel to the air, how do you get there to your house? A voice said, follow the light. What light? Gosel looked around. Suddenly, a light, like the beam of a flashlight, shone in the room. It bounced out the door and Gosel followed it until she got to the Unhealthy Fairy's gray stone solid castle. It looked like a haunted house. Gosel knocked on the door. A tall woman with a long black dress opened it. She smiled at her. Her dark hair was cropped to her waist and was flung back from her face, and her thin gray wings fluttered in the wind. Ah, oh, my child of healthy. Come in, come in. Raise up, raise up. Come, raise up. Immediately, a long, tall, skinny dog 
that almost looked as if it had been gently pulled into, well, a long dog, came toward the unhealthy fairy. Gossel pet raised a dog. I petted Raise a dog, and she breathed right in my face, and it smelled bad. A small burp belched quietly from Raise a dog, said Gossel to the fairy. Gossel made a face. Raise a dog hissed like a cat. Raise a dog loves to hiss. She's very lanky, long, and old. She's a greyhound dog that's very grey, said the unhealthy fairy. A woman with black hair tied in a bun came up to the unhealthy fairy from a bedroom. She stared at Gossel, and Gossel looked back at her kindly. Raise a dog loves blades of grass, she said. Here, give her a treat. <laughs> Chapter 33 Adventures That night, at her house, Gossel heard a knock on her door. When she opened it, a chair was on the porch. So was a bed. The bed had hands and feet. The chair did not, though. The bed handed her a note which said, You have a potion to make things come to life. Make this chair come to life now. Gossel said, Uh, here's the potion. I'll sprinkle it on. She did. The chair sprang up, grabbed the potion away from Gossel, and gave it to the bed. The bed took it and sprang away, even further out the door. On its way, it dropped the potion right by the threshold. Gossel, relieved, picked it up. The chair followed the bed. Gossel thought that was a bit strange. Gossel sat back and sighed. Just as a big snore came out of Gossel, a knock sounded at the door again. Gossel threw a few drops of the potion on the door and cried, Open! The door, alive now, opened at command, and Gossel heard someone step in. Is Gossel here, Miss Thundermess? It was a female voice. Gossel sleepily walked toward the door. A tall woman stood at the door, looking at her. It has been said that you have done really great things in your lifetime, Miss Thundermess. Many of them. We have a question for you. Would you come with me and we could interview you? Gossel's heart beat quickly. Uh, of course. I'll do that for you. Come on, let's go, she said. The woman briskly ran out of the house, with Gossel following her. Ferris tried to follow them too, but she was too tired, and followed them only a few steps before falling asleep in the doorway. Gossel followed the woman into a golden carriage. Colby Calais was sitting in it, looking at Gossel. Gossel stared back, amazed at her, amazed that she had come back, not only to Gossel's house, but to herself. She was dressed in a simple, short dress and dull tight. Evidently, she had straightened her gold curls, and the only piece of jewelry that she had was a simple bracelet without any jewels. She bore no resemblance to Misty and what Misty had done. She looked like a plain city girl whose name was Colby. Gossel managed to croak out Colby before she fell onto her. And Colby didn't flinch. She just whispered, Gossel? Chapter 34. Caught. The woman stared in disbelief, and then she sat in the driver's seat and whipped the white horse at a walk. Gossel scowled in their direction. She couldn't help it. She despised when horses got whipped in carriages. It was the old way. Snow fell. White, big, fluffy flake that drifted down from a baby blue dawning sky. Gossel was sitting beside Colby, and she couldn't help but to go to sleep. When Gossel awoke to Colby's voice, it sounded worried and anxious. She said, I am Colby Calais. I can't go on tour now. Believe. Suddenly the horse gave a sudden neigh. <laughs> it reared up and Gossel felt the need to clutch something. The horse pulled, but the cart had stopped moving. Gossel shouted, Colby! At that moment, a figure in a snowy, feathery white gown came into Gossel's view. She thought it looked familiar. She looked closer and then understood it was Misty. Colby was beside her, shrieking. Misty sent a stream of fog into the front of the horse, who was stamping its snow, thickly covering the ground. The horse pulled with all its might, but the wheels were stuck in a deep drift and sunk deeper in it still. Gossel! the driver cried loudly. Gossel, you will be okay. Let's use your potion that you used to open the door on me. What a smart person to remember this. Gossel felt for the potion in her pocket, and when she pulled it out, Colby said, Sprinkle some on the carriage, then it will walk out of the drift. Gossel shook some out, and feet and hands sprang out of the carriage. This is creepy. Walk out of the drift, yelled Gossel to the carriage. After Gossel had got out and unharnessed the horse, the carriage sprang up. The wheels spun, and it fell back down. Gossel and the others cheered and clambered in after it had freed itself. Misty was pale. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, they said. Our apologies are good, but you still need to be punished, said Colby. You will ride on the horse instead of being in a nice, warm 
carriage, said the driver. Misty glowered, but said nothing more. She climbed onto the horse as the carriage, barefooted, walked away, complaining it was cold. This is strange, thought Gozzle. When they got to Gozzle's house, after picking up Misty, because Misty had waited there to be interviewed too, Colby had explained what she was mad at Misty for. You see, remember when she disguised herself as me? She had said. Yes, said Gozzle. Well, Misty had confused reporters, pretended to be someone famous. She had made me miss all that concert that I had done. That entire concert. Oh, Gozzle agreed, understanding why she was mad at Misty. The next morning, after the interview, which had gone pretty well, except that Gozzle had a hard time remembering all of her adventures, Colby had left, and sleepy Gozzle found herself awake at 12 o'clock at noon. Not only that, but she was finally lying in her own home, in her own soft bed. She had finally slept an entire night in her own house. That had not happened for weeks, thought Gozzle. Chapter 35 Midday for Gozzle At first, Gozzle saw it. Beware, Beware. Ms. Armia. It was a sign written on wood in red sharpie ink. Gozzle did not understand it at all. It was a foggy Christmas Eve, and Gozzle slipped the tiny wood in her pocket and raced upstairs to look for more clues. When she was upstairs, a bowl on the table that had been there before was still there, but now it was filled with half-eaten oatmeal. Beside it, a piece of wood read, They, they call, call it, it mush. mush. A CD was playing on the radio, and when Gozzle pulled it out, she saw it said, Zaz Faz Muck Radio, all in it, number one. Gozzle, puzzled, looked around. Toilet paper littered the floor. The bathroom was worse than the kitchen. Orange juice sat in a plastic cup on the toilet. Written on a piece of wood beside it were words, Orange juice is very delicious. Gozzle did not know what to do. She looked at the bathtub to reveal a half-eaten cookie. That night, she wrote a note and put it on her bedside table. Dear whoever you are, please tell me who you are. Why did you leave all those things around our house? Then after a moment, she wrote, From Gozzle. Later in the night, she awoke with a start. Something, a silhouette, was moving toward Gozzle. Suddenly it turned her lamp on and picked up her letter. It muttered, What should I write with? Hmm. Gaza sat up. It turned. It was white with the bottom of its mouth bigger than the top. It looked very strange. Then it asked Gazel, Want to ride in my hot? Hot? asked Gazel. Yes, hot, replied the creature. I am a bat. Come. Gazel followed the bat into a gray mobile that looked like a sliced pie. It was so hot that they could see yellow and orange inside it, a little like flames. Gazel sat beside the bat in the slice spot, and the bat drove her outside, all around the town of Baz. They were suddenly in there. Gozzle remembered to ask the bat, Why did you put things around my house, like orange juice, pieces of wood, and a half-eaten cookie? Well, I didn't put things around your house like wood and a half-eaten cookie. That was probably my cousin, the Mir. Do you want to meet her? Yes, I do, said Gozzle. And when I do, I will tell her that she shall never mess my house up again. They drove up to an orange house and knocked. A gray creature stepped out, lanky and small with a pointed chin. Oh, hello, said the man. It beckoned. Come! Why'd you mess up my house? demanded Gozzle to the startled meh. It wasn't me. It was Mew. <laughs> Want to see Mew? Yes, said Gozzle. A brown oval creature with a white stripe in the middle of it came out of the room and went up to Gozzle. I'm Mew, it said. Hi, Mew, said Gozzle. Why'd you mess up my house? Mess? said Mew. Mess? Mess? Yes. Why? cried Gozzle. Why? Mew stared at her blankly. Then he grabbed Gozzle. He lifted her up and carried her to the Baz hot. Do you know how to drive this? asked Mew. No, replied Gozzle. Well then, well I'll just clean up your house while you're asleep. I thought it was empty and it would be a perfect home for Mew, replied Mew. So why'd you eat a half-eaten cookie? asked Gozzle. That wasn't me, it was Seal. Who's Seal? A girl, Ma. That's what I am, a Ma replied Mew. Well, bye, Mew, cried Gozzle, as she neighed, just as Ginger had told her a year ago, turned around twice, and really believed she was a horse. The next minute, she was a chestnut mare, galloping away to her own home. That was quicker than walking. When she got there, however, she realized that Ginger had never told her the way to turn back. She padded into her own bedroom. How she wished for Sonora, 
or Kelly Clarkson, or Colby, or one of those potions for hands and feet furniture, or even the unhealthy fairy, even raise a dog. Then, thinking of dogs, thinking this night could not get any worse, she realized what a fool she was. Where was Fairest? Chapter 36 Enchanted Gosel moaned. She paced and remembered that she had left the door open when she had gone with the woman and Colby. She clapped her hooves together around the potion and tried to shake it on something, anything. She wanted something alive in here with her. A lamp grew hands and feet and stood up. It turned around and it gripped its plug and pulled it out. Then it jumped down next to Gosel. Uh, can you sprinkle some potion on the couch in that empty container over there? Also that table? Gosel asked. It did, and soon the hands and feet creatures gathered around her. The couch lifted her up and put her on top of it. It said. She would never turn back from a horse into a human. This was awkward and strange, but at least things were alive. Let's make the bushes and trees come to life. They might know. The container cried, taking the potion from the lamp. It ran outside and did so. A tree hopped on to Gosel, and Gosel ran to every tree and bush that was alive. Finally, a tree said, Well, I do know how, but it takes a rope and a ladder, both with hands and feet. They managed to get both supplies, and the tree said, It's really quite simple. Run! The hands and feet creatures all laughed. They didn't know after all. Oh no, it had just been a plan to get all of them to come to life. Then Gosel had an idea. She didn't neigh, but she t turned around twice the other way than she'd done to turn into a horse. Then she suddenly felt a strong belief that she wasn't a horse. She was a girl. She was Gosel. She was Gosel Thundermess. She was in her room with the creatures with hands and feet. She was... Suddenly she found herself standing up, like a human, like a girl, like herself. She had reverted back to herself. She had done it. Suddenly all her joy turned into ice when she remembered. She still needed to find Fairest. Gosel reached into her pocket for the potion, but just as she felt it, she let go. A big silver carriage, drawn by a team of six white horses, was moving smoothly across the road. Gosel could hear the click of their hooves as they turned on a curve on the road. She hadn't yet taken it in when she saw, sitting next to the driver, a snow-white dog who looked exactly like Ferris. Chapter 37. Gosel takes a ride. Ferris! cried Gosel, rushing to the carriage. She hadn't gone two steps when she realized the driver was Colby. Colby, I, I was a horse, and I turned back, and that's my dog, Ferris. When she had filled Colby in since the mare would, she told her about Fairest. This dog was out wandering in the snow. It probably is Fairest. Here, I'll drive you guys around a little bit and talk a little, and then back to your house. And this time, let's not get stuck in the snow. They rode until they were in Gosel's house. That is, the carriage and the six horses weren't, but Colby, Gosel, and Fairest were. After talking for a while, the furniture still had hands and feet, but they were all where they were before. They waited silently, being good, and patient. Gosel tearfully said goodbye to Colby, and she left, comforting her with the knowledge that she would come back some day. Gosel sighed. What a day, and night, and day again. She needed rest now. She had gotten none. When Gosel awoke, Gosel stretched, sighed, and said, Well, I guess today can't wait for me. It's Christmas Day. And that sleigh ride with Colby and Ferris was breathtaking and wonderful. After she had opened all her marvelous, beautiful presents, she fed and walked Ferris and gave her water. A week after, Gosel heard a knock on her door. She reluctantly went to open it. About twenty girls stood in the doorway, like a swirl of color. All of them wore a beautifully shaded dress. But ahead of them all, in pure white, was Misty. Chapter 38. Mystery People. Misty! cried Gosel, surprised. Come in, all of you. Sit down, and I'll introduce yourselves. Who are you? We are mystery people. We have decided to show ourselves. So, just like Misty, people that decided that they would commit their lives to disguising and invisibility, but they had come to show themselves to Gosel. What an honor, thought Gosel. Oh, cried Gosel. A black-dressed girl named Horsel said, My dear, please let me tell you. There are still more people to be found, finished Crystal, who was wearing a light pink dress. Of course there were. Your sister, Grace. Gosel, there's something I must tell you, she said. Violet, a girl with a long purple gown, said, A true sister can't act so mean to you. Not ever. 
Yes, there is no doubt about it. She is not your sister. She is not even your relation. But but how could she be? They had a baby, stuttered Gazel. No, said Torsel. That baby, that Grease, is the daughter of Misty. Misty? cried Gazel. Yes, I liked you. So I asked your parents if they could raise Grease. I named her after an evil enchantress, an evil mystery enchantress. And then I could not raise her anymore. I had decided to commit my life to being a mystery. Misty, Misty, I... began Gosel, but Crystal stopped her. We were also wondering, could you adopt your friend as Morty? Adopt her? Isa? Never! cried Gosel. She's way too rich. We can't... Please do. Please. Misty begged so much that finally Gosel agreed. But would Isa become her older sister? She would. What a strange thing. She was even older than Beatrice. Beatrice was her big sister, who was in high school in ninth grade. Isa shall be adopted by me if she will bring Wandru. Gosel blurted out before she could stop herself. Wait, wasn't Wandru supposed to be a secret? What? said a girl with golden curls and a maroon dress. Who is Wandru? The pot that grants wishes, Gosel said before she could stop herself. What? What? They all cried. Never mind, never mind, said Gosel. Suddenly another knock came on her door, and she opened it. She saw her friend Sugarmass. Sugarmass. She smiled at her old friend. It was so nice to see her. She let Sugarmass in, and Sugarmass stared at all the people. The girls all stared in turn at Sugarmass. I have some uh, company, but sit down and relax, stuttered Gosel. Sugarmass sat on the couch and watched. Please tell us, who is Wandru? Asked Violet. Gosel stared hard at her. She blinked and sighed. I can't, she said. Violet looked sharply at her. The girl with the golden curls looked at her, too. She sat next to Sugarmass and Gosel. Who is Wandru? The reason we all want to know is because we want to keep our city safe. I am Melissa, by the way. Gosel told Melissa who Wandru was, and thought of wishes, and dreamed of the wish pot. She frowned and kept her eyes forward. Melissa smiled. She told Gosel that was a wonderful adventure that she must have had with Wandru. It was, Gosel agreed. She was so ready to just be home, just to be a girl named Gosel, and just to be free of all those weird hands and feet creatures and all the crazy adventures. Gosel? It was a familiar voice. Gosel turned and drew in a gasp. There, standing behind her, was Grease. Chapter 39. The Spell Greases. Everyone stared. They all flinched, and Grease glowered at them. Gosel didn't know what to do. Oh no, Grease, sighed Gosel. Misty was still so white and bright that she seemed to be the sun. She was glowing because she was now shrinking into a disguise. Gosel groaned and glared. The people all stared too. A girl with curly, bushy, golden locks and a red and black gown hurried toward Gosel. What is it? What's going on? She asked. All the adventures are starting again, Gosel cried. But they weren't. Gosel had no idea what she was talking about. She felt woozy and uncomfortable. Grease was walking over to Sugarmass and began to unweave her dress. It was expensive and white and made of soft silk, just as had happened before. Gosel tried to go to Sugarmass, and as she did, she felt as if she were stepping through a bubble. Another Gosel was beside Sugarmass, and another Sugarmass was sitting on the couch. She saw a Grease who was busy scribbling on Gosel's best paper. She suddenly understood. She was inside a mirror, and the mirror was playing back all her adventures. Sugarmass cried, Misty! Gosel jumped out of the mirror and lifted it up, put it on her desk. And it must be from Misty. Gosel was confused. Mystery people were all around. The mirror was playing, and Gosel sat quietly next to Sugarmass. Everyone! Gosel cried, having no idea what was going on. Melissa heard Gosel and came forward. Everyone! She cried. Come on, let's go. People were barging in on this poor girl. The mystery people heard and all got up. In a clamber that lasted about two seconds, the mystery people left Gosel. Gosel sighed. She wondered what to do. Sugarmass got up and left before Gosel could stop her. So did Grease. Grease and Sugarmass were back in their own houses. Everything she did led her to a different adventure. Gosel thought, but what had this been? Where had this mirror come from, and why was it like this? It was Misty, Gosel thought. Misty was always trying to be kind, always trying to use her magic powers to help others, but she always just made it worse. Especially for Gosel. It was all Misty. Chapter 40, Wandru. Gosel was confused. Still, she was lost and unsure. She'd just settle down to rest and shake it off when her doorbell rang. Again, she opened it slowly and saw Iza standing in front of her, holding Wandru. Iza, she said, you're my sister now. 
Oh, I know when I brought Wandrew, said Izzy flatly. My mom wanted me to get adopted. Why? asked Gozel. Because she's moving, said Izza, then said no more. Gozel still was surprised at all of this. Grease had been no relation of hers. Izza was her sister now. Well, come on in, Izza. This is your home now, Gozel said softly. Izza plowed into the guest room and made it her own. Within an hour, she had the bed set up with a 24-inch thick comforter on her bed, a huge overflowing closet, and an overloaded stained glass window filled with sun catchers. Izza had an overflowing bookcase by her dresser and Wandru, towering over the light pink carpet, reaching to the high arched sunroof covered in a glass topping. It was a very delicate room for Izza. When Gozel saw it, she didn't know what to say. She was very confused that Izza would be able to pack so many things in sight. Wait, she'd only brought Wandru. She'd wished for everything to appear in the guest room by consulting Wandru. Izza, said Gozel softly, wasn't my guest room a lot smaller than this? It never had a glass roof or light pink carpet. I only wished on Wandru, hissed Izza in a small but unfrightened voice. At this, Wandru shook a little and disappeared. Wandru, cried Gozel, come back. We won't hurt you. Wandru returned, but instead of black, she was painted hot pink, and instead of the name Wandru painted on her, it said, Wonderful Wishes. <laughs> if it was a mug for hot cocoa, she should say Warm Wishes, laughed Gozel. Warm Wishes? Echoed Wandru. Well, I can I wish, wish on myself, myself, you know, and I, I want, want it to be hot pink. Fine, Wandru, said Izza, finding no humor in this at all. But your name's still Wandru. With a wish, she changed the Wonderful Wishes sign back to Wandru. Wandru did not protest. Chapter 41 <laughs> the best concert ever. The next morning there was a knock on Gozel's door, and when she opened it, Kelly Clarkson stood there, looking very shy. Kelly, cried Gozel, come in. Actually, I can't, said Kelly. What? said Gozel, and Kelly looked a little unsure. Well, maybe I could try, she said. What? asked Gozel. Okay, first of all, I haven't really met you yet. Why are you here? I don't know, and I don't think I can come in, said Kelly, and compassion filled Gozel. She was sorry that she'd said what she just said. They had only seen each other at the dried old creek for only a few minutes with that girl, Leah. Kelly Clarkson grinned a little and pushed with all her might against air. Yes, she was just pushing against air. She couldn't come anywhere near Gozel. Kelly? cried Gozel. Why? It's Misty, she said. No matter how hard I try, I can't get away from her. She's after me for some reason, cried poor Kelly. I'm a celebrity. I have to be strong and stand up to her, but I can't anymore. She just makes me break down. I think you should relax, Kelly, said Gozel. Go to someone else's concert for a while and have a quick break. Whose concert should I go to? She asked. Colby Kelly is having one, Gozel replied. I have an extra ticket. Let's... She stopped suddenly when she remembered Izza was there. My sister can't come, she finished helplessly. She won't. Then let's just go. Leave a note for her, suggested Kelly. Or is she younger? No, she's older, replied Gozel. But I just thought you needed a new artist. I mean, anyways, since you don't seem like you're doing well, and the spell from Misty, you know. We can help break it, by the way. I'll just do that. I'll just leave a note for Izza. Kelly nodded and said, Yes, I've heard of Colby Kelly. I will watch her concert, and I will enjoy it. Gozel wrote a note for Izza and picked up the tickets. And that night... She went with Kelly. As they drove together through the bright lit streets, Gozel couldn't stop her intense shaking. You're excited, said Kelly. She smiled and had said it like she knew that was true. Yes, I am excited, Kelly, said Gozel, barely breathing. I want to see Colby Kelly again! Whoa, said Kelly. Okay, I know you're excited. Okay, calm down. When they arrived, the auditorium was packed, but somehow Gozel and Kelly found a seat in the front row. They sat down, and Colby Calais was in front of the stage. She stood there calmly, like any other person, and Gozel couldn't help herself. She jumped up and went to her quickly. She had missed her so much. She went crazy. She screamed really loud, Colby Calais! Poor Colby did not know what to do. She looked at Gozel, who said, I'm sorry, Colby. I just, I just, <laughs> she trailed off. She couldn't hold herself up any longer, she realized. For five years, she'd held herself together, at least. With the adventures, everything. Iza, the sweet and unhealthy fairies. But now she couldn't anymore. Haunted with constant fear and lack of rest and not just being a girl again. She physically collapsed. Kelly stepped forward, but Misty's spell still caught her. And she couldn't get anywhere near Gazel. When Gazel came to from being unconscious, 
Colby Calais was singing tied down on stage and looking at Gosel. She smiled when she saw that Gosel was all right and sang a little louder. Gosel, when she recovered, sang along. I'm tied down, I'm looking around, and no one else, so don't hold me down, sang Gosel before she stopped suddenly, letting Colby finish it. The reason she stopped was that Iza was standing in the doorway. She grinned, then walked in and sat down near Gosel. She didn't have any tickets. What was she doing here? Just then, Gosel saw a slip of paper in her hands. She had tickets! She would go! She liked Colby Calais! Gosel grinned at Iza. She'd remembered what she'd said. I can't go, Gosel. I don't care about that singer. I don't really care about concerts anymore, Gosel. I'm reading this book right now. Reading about how to change Wandru into a wishing teapot. Wouldn't that be much more beautiful and delicate to carry around? Gosel had turned away with tears in her eyes, as she had cried whenever somebody insulted Colby like that. But now she was her loyal sister, and she had gone for her, and she was smiling. Gosel grinned at Iza. When the concert was over, they left all together. Kelly, Gosel, and Iza. Colby caught Gosel before she left and said, It's wonderful to have such a devoted fan, and it's great that you could see me for real. Again, Gosel grinned at Colby. Colby smiled back silently, and then they parted to see each other again someday, Gosel hoped. Was that good, Kelly? asked Gosel. It was wonderful, Gosel. Thank you, said Kelly. It was good to finally see her relieved, gone from all tension and worry. Chapter 42. Strawberries and a Spell Gosel got up out of her warm bed and headed downstairs, and then opened the fridge. She pulled out a bag of strawberries and put them on the counter. Then she ran into the big living room and cried, Strawberries! Strawberries! Moldy old strawberries! Instantly a girl appeared, and she wore all red and pink. She had red hair, even. They both started running around and yelling, Strawberries! 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 strawberries, strawberries, strawberries yay! Strawberries! Strawberries! With a start, Gosel opened her eyes. It had all been a dream. Strawberries? Gosel sighed and puzzled. For real, she slipped out of her covers. She decided to sort out over all of her adventures and see which one she liked best. I found a pulpit man in the grass and envied Iza from the start, she said aloud. I wrote to Misty and met Sugar Miss. No. No, before I met Sugar Mess, I saw the spell greases. No, no, I met Sugar Mess before he stopped. It was impossible to pull all of her adventures into a sequence. It seemed like she'd never be the same. Misty, she called loudly. Misty, come here. Instantly, Misty appeared. Gosel, she said softly. Misty, I was wondering if you could help me visit the mystery people. Certainly. Gosel followed Misty into a door hidden in the wall, and there she froze. Swirls of color enveloped the room as she stepped silently in. Gosel smiled as she felt herself become part of the swirling mists of magic. The music, the colors, and the glow and wonder of it all. Misty marched blindly on and beckoned briskly to Gosel, as if she did not care about anything, even the beautiful music. Gosel followed her without a word. She walked on and on until she saw a girl with a long black dress and blue eyes staring at her and willing her to come closer. Gosel stepped a little closer and waved, but she didn't want to lose Misty. She had to keep her pace, so she beckoned for the girl to follow. Kelly Clarkson sent me here to look for you, the girl said, or at least she sent me to your house, but then there was a girl there. The girl slipped into a hidden door in it, and I followed. She wants to know if you'll help her undo her spell. What? asked Gosel. She has that spell still on her? How unkind of Misty. That girl you saw probably was Misty. She can't get near you, said the girl. Remember? Remember that spell? Yes, I do, said Gosel. I already told you. I knew about that spell. Suddenly, images of the few days before flooded into Gosel's mind, and the spell became even more horrible. Kelly's haunted expression, her look of sorrow, edged with annoyance as she pushed at the air to come into Gosel's house. I don't know how to undo it, replied Gosel. Let's go to her. But first I have to catch up with Misty. Gosel ran to Misty and walked swiftly beside her. Where's Torsal, Crystal, Violet, Melissa, everyone? She asked. I need to ask them why they all just left so quickly when they had visited. Oh, I can tell you that, said Misty. It was because they knew it. They told each other. You know, it was because they felt like they were intruding. Oh, but they weren't, cried Gosel. They couldn't have been intruding. I tried to make them feel welcome. Misty, I was just confused when they came because of that mirror you gave me. It was strange. Oh, that, said Misty. I know about that. I hope it confused you enough to make you have senses again. Gosel sighed. Tell them, Misty. Please tell them. I have to go now. 
I will, Gosel, I will, replied Misty. She then vanished from sight, and Gosel hurried towards the blue-eyed, black-dressed girl. In minutes, Kelly Clarkson was with them on Gosel's front step. While Gosel stood in the doorway, she pushed closer and a little closer, and little by little, the spell loosened until it was broken. Oh, thank you, Gosel, cried Kelly, relieved. You saved me for the hundredth time. Oh, well, I don't even know how I broke that, said Gosel. It was your willpower and your faith that you knew that you would do it, Gosel, said Kelly. That's all magic is, is knowing that it will happen, having true faith and believing that it will happen. Then she turned and slowly walked away from Gosel. Chapter 43. What happened to Juan Drew? Gosel sat on her couch with Ferris licking her. It felt so good to just be herself, to just be Gosel, and to have a dog stretched out on her lap. Iza, she called sleepily, for it was only two in the morning, and she had come out because she couldn't sleep, not ever. Iza, she'd found out, couldn't sleep either, so she was out in an instant. She was writing really hard math problems down, and then challenging herself when she didn't need to. She was really obsessed with math. I'm coming, Gaza, she screeched loudly. Hush, Iza, said Gazel. It's two in the morning. And besides, my name's not Gaza. It's Gazel. Oh, right, Gaza, taunted Iza. Remember the hands and feet creatures? The furniture that grew hands and feet? Asked Gazel casually, for it seemed natural to her now. Yeah, replied Iza. Yep, said Gazel. Well, do you like them? Asked Iza. Not really, not unless they're very helpful. She said, <laughs> suddenly, she heard laughter from all the furniture. They grew hands and feet and walked to her, gathering around her. Gazel was taken back, and she waited for one to speak. A chair pushed up to her and asked, You really don't like us? No, I, I didn't mean that, said Gazel. I only meant when you guys are helpful is the nicest of all the times that I've seen you guys, and the rest of the times really never seem to help at all. Oh, replied the chair. Well, we can't do anything to help that except trust you. Come on, Gazel. And you too, Mud. Mud? Gazel walked a little closer to the chair. It gripped her. They started forward out of the house. Iza stayed put, so the chair let go of Gazel and pulled Iza forward. Mud, I said you must come too! It cried. Well, I didn't know you were talking to me because my name is not Mud. Oh, well, now you know that we will call you Mud, even though you're not Mud, laughed a couch. Then Iza was grabbed by the lamp and they walked out the door, the chair gripping Gazel again. When they reached Gazel's neighborhood street, Gazel happened to look down and she noticed shards of hot pink china-like material littering the sidewalk. She recognized it somehow, like it had been part of something that she he had once possessed. What is that? Asked Gosel to the chair. The chair ignored her, so she asked again. It is something very important, began the chair. It has a very important, kind, beautiful, wonderful name. Wonderful name. That is in which? I have no idea. It's probably a jar or a pot or something like that. Ah, oh, sighed Gosel when Iza suddenly squeezed her hand. Gosel, she cried. I know what that is. What is it? Asked Gosel. It's... She paused for a moment before going on in a somewhat softer, teary voice. It's Wandru. What? Gosel's eyes filled with salty droplets. What? Wandru helped all of us to even help you find a home, Iza. What? Said Iza. Remember your small apartment? Asked Gosel. And all the rooms? And how you walk in and it's a mansion? Yes. Well, how you got that to happen is that you wished on Wandru. Oh, cried Iza. You found me out. Yes, Iza, said Gosel. I'm sorry you were an orphan all those years. Oh, it's fine. My parents left when I was six. They never meant to. Wandru practically raised you, cried Gosel. And to think of her coming to an end like this? Come on, keep going! Yeah, come on! Go, Gosel! Go, Gosel! Go, Gosel! Go, 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 Come on, Mud! Yeah, come on, Mud! Hey, Mud! Come on, let's go! Can you, it's Mud? Seriously, Mud. Where all you need, Mud? Come on, Mud, let's go. Come on, Gozel. You too, Gozel. Screeched the furniture, and they pushed on. Gozel wept constantly for Wandru, and so did Iza. What could they do to save Wandru? 
Chapter 44, The Attempt. They walked on through streets and towns and even huge cities until one hazy hour of many. They saw a white figure moving toward them. It was Misty. Not only that, but she held a completely unharmed, unbroken Wandru. Misty, cried Gazel. Wandru, wept Iza, running forward. She gently took Wandru from Misty and, with a wish, she tenderly changed the name on the pot from Wandru to Wonderful Wishes. Then she wept for joy again. Her bond with Wandru would never Loosen. Misty, cried Gosel. Do you know them? She pointed to the hands and feet furniture. Yes, I do, said Misty. Now, everyone, you know the rules. You must never come to live for no purpose. But we did have a reason, yelled the lamp. She said she doesn't like us when we were alive. That wasn't true, yelled Gosel again. She was about to explain again when Misty yelled, Go back, all of you. Now, Iza and Gosel, and of course, Wandru, you all stay with me. The furniture all reluctantly walked quickly away, never looking back. Ha ha to them cried Wandru. Oh, Wandru, cried Iza. I'm so glad you're here now. I thought you were gone. No, no nothing, nothing happened, happened to these Mulligan, said Wandru. Misty, Wandru. Misty used a wish. What? what? Asked Iza and Gazel. I have one too, said Misty. She pulled out another wish pot, exactly like Wandru. It was blue, however, and it was also a girl, named Lovely Night. I wished for those shards on the sidewalk to reform right back into Wandru. That was my attempt to save her. I wasn't sure if it would work, but it did. Thank you, Misty, said Iza. Thank you so much, Misty. Chapter 45, Departure As Misty whisked them back to their own house, Gosel said, Misty, what I really want to know is, what happened to Wandru? Wandru got found by the unhealthy fairy. So then, she stole Wandru and threw her against the sidewalk with jealousy because she wanted one too. She wanted one so much that she did not want anyone else to have one. Wandru shattered, and Iza, you were here in your room a whole day looking for Wandru. Yes, and I did mean to tell Gosel. But I was too frantic. That's why I didn't see you that day, cried Gosel. Wonderful, Iza. Because a few days before, Iza had been gone for the entire day. Gosel had called her name over and over, but she hadn't seen her. Thanks for forgiving me, Gosel, cried Iza, delighted. Gosel did want to see Colby again, one last time, before she left on her tour for six months. So she wished on Wandru, and a few minutes later, she was at Colby's front step, knocking softly. She answered the door and beckoned to her. Colby, I just wanted to see you before you're gone for six months, said Gosel. It's nice to see you, Gosel Thundermass, said Colby. It was wonderful knowing you. Thank you so much for making my life so much better. Oh, I don't know if I did that, sighed Gosel. But you're welcome anyway, Colby Calais. She smiled. I'll always remember knowing you. The last thing Gosel remembered that day was that she met Colby's hazel gaze, smiled drowsily, then slowly walked back to her house. Colby had shown her true self to Gosel, and Gosel was glad that she could trust her. When late that night, she slipped into her bed, warm, comfortable, and soft. She decided that she wasn't tangled and confused in her adventures anymore. She was just glad to be there, to know Colby, Kelly, Misty, Ginger, Sonora, Sugarmess, and Iza, and to just be herself, just to be Gosel. Epilogue. Gosel lived in great happiness now, in her home, just enjoying who she was and anything that happened to her. She just went along for the ride. She always made the best of things, but when she had her hardest times, she allowed herself to consult Wandru and Colby. Kelly was always better off since she went to Colby Kelly's concert and was always grateful to Gosel for taking her. So, with Iza, Misty, Kelly, Colby, Sonora, and everyone else she'd met in her adventure, she decided that each person played a big part in it all, and that every Everyone understood. That was the story of Gosel Thundermess's free adventures. The end. Thank you for listening. This story was recorded and produced by Colby Fan Incorporated using Audacity, the recording program. Remember to visit ColbyFan.com and enjoy everything that I have there. It's not just a fan website, by the way. It has my other creations for children to enjoy and pictures and stories. Thank you again for listening to Gosel's Free Adventures. This was the first book in the Gosel series.